today I decided to talk to you about squirrels that um, live in Pennsylvania. Um, most of them will be familiar probably, but um, there might be a couple of surprises that I'll talk to you about. Um, the specimens that I'm mainly going to show you are um, called study skins, and um, they're prepared by moving this, removing the skin from the body and stuffing it with cotton. So when you see that they have white eyes, that's cotton. And there's um, wire in the tails and the legs to support them. Um, and then what we do with the rest of the body, we may remove um, some uh, liver, heart, and kidney tissue and preserve it in ultra-cold freezers so that we can do DNA studies or other molecular uh, research. And um, we also uh, clean the skeletons. Uh, we often will preserve uh, the skull, but um, sometimes we do the whole skeleton. Most of them aren't put together like this. Um, we take all the bones apart so that people who want to do research can handle them separately and take measurements and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm sure this kind of preparation isn't as familiar to you as the things that we display in the museum. Uh, th this is called a taxidermy mount. And these um, you know, are all the kinds of things you see on exhibit. And the reason for um, the different kinds of preparations is that um, it doesn't take as much skill in some ways to do a study skin. The taxidermy mounts um, have to be you know, uh, done. There's an art and a craft to it to make them look just like they do in nature. And that takes a lot more time. So um, the study skins generally take maybe about two hours to do everything from start to finish. And um, they don't take up as much space. And that's kind of important, too. So um, I'm just going to start by talking about um, all the different squirrels and telling you a little bit about them. And then if you have questions, I'll be ready for those. Um, so this is a, a gray squirrel. Uh, it's the most common squirrel, I guess, of, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, it's uh, found throughout the state. Um, this one is a pretty big individual. Um, it's, a, it's a male, but they don't differ in size between the males and females. Um, they do tend to have a fairly um, thick skin, and so sometimes when somebody's skinning one, they can actually stretch the skin and when they stuff it, it looks bigger than it was in life. But uh, one of the things we do, um, you see all of these that I'm holding will have a tag on them. Um, that includes information about measurements that we take, uh, including the weight. Uh, it also includes the locality in detail, the place where uh, the specimen was collected, um, and the date it was collected. Because sometimes that's important, if especially if um, an animal um, hibernates and you've suddenly find, well, this one was out pretty late for, you know, an animal that hibernates. Or, um, you know, uh, just for the time of year that they're active, uh, if they have slightly different color uh, changes during their, during their life, uh, you know, during the, the annual cycle. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the gray squirrel uh, is mainly found in deciduous forests, which are really common in Pennsylvania. Um, they tend to uh, be able to tolerate park-like exist existence a little bit better than some of their relatives. They don't mind if they're in places where there are only a few trees. Um, I want to show you uh, another gray squirrel because this is one that is a, a, a black-faced or melanistic gray squirrel. Um, people who live in Pittsburgh and some other locations around the state uh, may see these more commonly um, than other places. Uh, they tend to, to crop up about one in every 1,800 to 2,000 births. But once they show up in the population, uh, it seems like um, they show up again. Uh, and so pretty soon, for instance, um, in the city of Pittsburgh, we, one of our parks, Shenley Park, um, is kind of known for black squirrels. People call us all the time and say, I just saw a really strange squirrel. Um, but other people who've lived around here for a long time know that, you know, the, the color phase, the black color phase is um, something that's kind of common in Shenley Park. Um, this particular specimen is from Tioga County. And actually, um, there's, again, a uh, 
sort of a concentration of uh, the black color phase in gray squirrels there. So um, this was one I knew that we had in the collection because I, the first time I ever heard of a black squirrel was from Tioga County. So I went to our collection and sure enough, there were a few. Um, the, it's, it's, even though I use the terminology phase, it doesn't mean it's a part of an individual's life. It's um, the same kind of terminology that's sometimes used for um, other species that have more than one sort of uh, color that can show up, like um, brown and uh, brown and gray, I think screech owls maybe, or there are um, t the timber rattler comes in, two, rattlesnake comes in two different phases. So it's just that particular color for that individual, even though we use the word phase. Um, another squirrel that's really probably more familiar to people in western Pennsylvania is the fox squirrel. It's generally a little bit bigger, although this guy is really big for a gray squirrel. It's generally a little bigger than the, the uh, gray squirrel. Um, and rather than having white tips on the tail and sort of white tips on a lot of the fur, um, it has more of a reddish or orangish uh, color. And the same goes for the, the, uh, the belly. Um, you can see that the uh, gray squirrel has a whitish belly and the fox squirrel has more of an, uh, of an orange belly. And it's actually sometimes brighter than this. Um, I, in my neighborhood, I have a, a, a little wooded area behind my house and we see these all the time. And they're really, they're amazingly uh, feisty. Uh, in fact, there's a uh, uh, window, there's a maple tree outside my window in my bathroom, as well as at the top of my uh, uh, steps. So I can go up to the top of the steps and look out into the trees where the, where the squirrels would be. And if they see me, sometimes they bark. And it's just kind of, they, they're very, um, you know, kind of leery of anything that they think of as an enemy. So if they're, if I see that they're barking and they're looking down, I can look down and pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna see a, a cat somewhere down there. So it thinks I'm an enemy too. And I'm pretty close sometimes if they see me in the bathroom window. Um, and the bark is just kind of like a burp, burp, burp. And it, I get a kick out of it because uh, they make themselves known and they think that you know, they're kind of tough. Um, they also like deciduous forest, um, they were woods, um, and um, they uh, used to exist uh, further east, but um, they have, there was a different subspecies that liked very dense woods, and you know, that's just not that common anymore in, in Pennsylvania. So the other subspecies um, isn't found too commonly, if at all, in the rest of the state. but. West of the Alleghenies, we've got the fox squirrel. Um, this is a red squirrel. Now, um, sometimes I've heard people actually refer to the fox squirrel as a red squirrel because of those, you know, reddish orange tips on their, their feet and their tails and stuff. But this is a true red squirrel. Um, my great grandfather used to call them pineys uh, because, in fact, uh, they live in, they prefer coniferous forests. Um, so we don't see them quite as often. Um, one thing that I'll say about uh, this little guy, uh, you may see evidence of them and not actually see them uh, in the woods because what they do is they eat the seeds between the, um, the scales on a pine cone. And so you'll, if you see pine cones that are really gnawed down, it may be the work of, of a red squirrel. Um, this one was collected in November of actually 1948, and you'll see that um, it's uh, it, it, the the white belly is separated from the the darker the dark red back uh, by a kind of a faint black line. This is actually the winter coat. Uh, the summer coat will have a much more distinct black line and a brighter red body, um, but you know that's really the only squirrel that I can think of that I'm going to show you that has much of a contrast between winter and summer coats. Uh, and that's triggered by um, the uh, sunlight, actually sunlight falling on the eyes. 
um, and, and um, signaling the pituitary gland that, you know, days are lengthening and, and, and that will cause the color change to occur. Um, the next squirrel is a chipmunk and probably most people in Pennsylvania have seen chipmunks running around in their yards, um, maybe digging holes or getting underneath uh, patio stones or, or bricks around uh, where they live. Um, sometimes people find them a little annoying because of the holes that they dig, but um, they're actually quite a pretty little uh, squirrel. And all of these are going to be mainly um, uh, herbivorous. Uh, they'll collect seeds, um, they'll eat um, vegetation, that kind of thing. But some actually do eat more um, meat, even going out and um, venturing out onto the road if there's a roadkill or something like that. Um, and in that regard, I'm going to show you our um, northern and southern flying squirrels. Um, they're actually, uh, they both occur in the state, but the southern flying squirrel isn't quite as common. It's, uh, I mean, the northern flying squirrel isn't quite as common. It's really along the northern tier of counties. Um, and when I say flying squirrel, um, the way these specimens are done up, you really can't tell very well, but there's actually a small membrane that occurs between the hind leg and the front leg, and it's used kind of like a parachute, not quite maybe that efficiently, but um, they, uh, they're they able to um, glide down from a high level down to the ground or down to a, a lower limb. Um, sometimes young ones um, come out of trees during storms um, and uh, end up on the ground, but they can't get back up to where they came from. They have to, they have to climb. Uh, so they've got this nice, you know, bushy tail and good claws on their feet to climb up the bark to get back where they came from. Both the flying squirrels are nocturnal. So we don't see them very often. Um, you may, uh, uh, if you have um, outside lighting that's triggered by motion, you might see them in your trees. Um, and um, they really prefer um, trees that have uh, holes dug by or chewed by other mammals or by uh, woodpeckers or old dead trees where you know they can just take up residence so um, you know you may not always want to cut down a tree if it's looking like it's not going to have any vegetation anymore any, any leaves because uh, lots of different animals including the flying squirrels um, use them for uh, for dens and we discovered by accident that flying squirrels uh, like meat. Um, I think we were trying to collect, and this was in graduate school, we were trying to collect skunks. And um, we used a little bit of liver. And this brought out flying squirrels like you wouldn't believe. It was chicken liver. And the flying squirrels just loved it. So it's, you know, one of those things that uh, was kind of unexpected. We learn more about their food habits by accident. Um, now the two specimens that I thought might be a little surprising to you are the groundhog, which you might not think of as a squirrel, but it is a member of the squirrel family. Um, and uh, I really didn't make much of a distinction here uh, because in Pennsylvania, most of our squirrels are tree squirrels. Um, the chipmunk it would be an exception. It's more of a, of a ground dwelling squirrel. And of course, the, the groundhog also is a ground dweller, it digs holes um, and annoys the farmers a lot. It eats a lot of, and well, probably gardeners as well, they eat a lot of uh, tulip bulbs and things like that from time to time. And, and um, also things that, uh, you know, crop, food crops that people plant. So uh, the groundhog isn't everybody's favorite to have right in their backyard, but of course on February 2nd everybody knows about the groundhog. <laughs> and I think Pennsylvania probably is the most um, uh, most common place that the whole story about the groundhog seeing his shadow first came out, although other places than Punxsutawney claim to have started that um, tradition, but I think 
Puxitani Phil is certainly one that's been around for a long time. The other squirrel, and the very last one I have to show you, is one that's going to be a real surprise. This is called the 13 line ground squirrel. Uh, it isn't a native squirrel to Pennsylvania, but it was brought here, I think, in around 1919 to begin with. Um, it was it, um, a species that uh, lived on the Great Plains, so, you know, the uh, Midwestern states. Uh, so their habitat is mostly, um, you know, uh, grasses, you know, pastures, fields, that kind of thing. Uh, but somebody was very fascinated by them and brought them back to Pennsylvania uh, and originally brought them to the little town of Polk, Pennsylvania in, I believe that's Venango County. Uh, it, there were colonies that got started because of, of the ones that were brought back in 1919. And I think by about 1934 or 35, um, we knew of 11 colonies. It's really odd because most of the time when you have an introduced species, if it can survive at all, it takes off and just spreads out and may cause, you know, um, trouble for the native species. But that didn't really happen with, uh, to any great extent with the 13-line uh, ground squirrel. If you look at it closely, it actually does have a series of lines uh, and dots that make up 13 different kind of stripes or, or dashes across the body. So they're kind of a pretty squirrel. Um, maybe not as good as our chipmunk, but it's a little similar in size. Um, and th But what's happened is um, they, they, they actually set up colonies. And um, from everything I've read, um, you know, they, they're very much like another squirrel, uh, member of the squirrel family that might be familiar to you from the Midwest and that, it, or, or the West, and that's the um, uh, prairie dog. Because they set up colonies and, um, you know, live communally, uh, share burrows and warn each other. You know, one will come up to the top and look around and if it sees an enemy, it'll send off this little whistle call and everybody kind of goes underground. Um, so uh, they, they have a lot in common in a way with their behavior and uh, that may be why they were able to survive. And so the only known counties in Pennsylvania where they occur are Mercer and Venango. And um, they, at one place where they seem to persist is, um, and this is one place where they were originally established, was on the grounds of the Polk State School. And so it's a, you know, sort of a park-like setting. Um, they weren't annoying to farmers or anything like that because, you know, it's just um, on the grounds of a, of a school uh, that's still around. And um, strangely enough, they're not as, um, uh, they don't reproduce as much as some other rodents. They may raise um, a litter of as many as nine, but they only raise one litter, litter in a summer takes a while for them to develop and I guess the colony kind of keeps an eye on them and, and keeps them, um, you know, fairly safe because there are plenty of adults to kind of keep them from being picked off. But like other squirrels, um, some of their enemies are things like uh, hawks, um, black snakes or other snakes, um, you know, some of the uh, things like coyotes, which are you know, have become more and more common in Pennsylvania. So various carnivorous things, even uh, weasels, which we don't see much of, but they're out there running around and looking for food, um, could prey on them uh, and other species of, of uh, squirrels. But um, for some reason, they've neither become a pest nor have they apparently completely died out in Pennsylvania. So uh, if you ever have an opportunity to be in the northwestern part of the state, uh, maybe you'll spot some of the 13 line ground squirrels running around. And um, I'll be glad to take questions if you have any. Okay. Oh, okay, the first question I have is, how rare are white squirrels? Um, well, they're much less common than the black phase. And the, um, if they're true albino squirrels, that's going to mean that they're, they have red eyes. 
Um, so they don't really uh, survive very well, and so it, it remains a fairly uncommon um, squirrel to observe. Um, ah, yes. So the red squirrel is actually, uh, the, the question is, are red squirrels a color phase like black squirrels? And uh, no, the answer to that is no. They're, they're distinctly different. Um, you might be able to see that they're a smaller animal. Um, I've actually seen one in, in my yard. Uh, I, I have uh, some hemlock trees and a white pine around and also a, a, a blue spruce. Um, so there are pine cones for them to forage on, but um, they're not real common in my neighborhood. And, um, and the color, the, the uh, changes in color to this animal are seasonal rather than it being um, a special type of um, another kind of squirrel. There, it's, a, it's a distinct species. And um, let's see. Hmm. Are there any seeds squirrels avoid, avoid or won't eat? Well, that's a, I don't know the answer to that question. I think they probably would eat virtually anything. <laughs> I know they eat even they eat things as as uh, different as peanuts or in, in the shell or you know or they're very much attracted to bird feeders that. Um, have peanuts as part of the mix. So, um, but, uh, and I also know that they absolutely love walnuts and especially black walnuts, which is kind of an amazing thing because black walnuts have a very thick shell. Um, they're hard to crack for humans, but I guess, you know, if you have those nice big gnawing teeth, it's um, still a challenge, but it's something that they're kind of equipped for. So um, that's uh, a, a kind of uh, two extremes of what I think of as we call them nuts, but they're you know they're actually in the same category as seeds. They eat um, you know sunflower seeds and all kinds of uh, smaller uh, seed type things, and they like uh, fruit you know berries um, that they can harvest from plants and things like that as well. So. Um, that's, um, those are both more or less seasonal type things, except for what people like to put out for them. So, um, that's, uh, uh, they, they have to kind of mix up their diet because some things aren't available all year long. Um, do I have any other questions? Oh, I'm getting a lot of questions. Um, can groundhogs climb trees like squirrels? Um, I, I don't think they try to. Um, I wouldn't, for one thing, they're often more common to open ground, uh, so they don't necessarily um, encounter trees as much. Uh, but I think that they're uh, considered more of, uh, almost like the largest ground squirrel. So that they, they probably, they probably wouldn't even think to try <laughs> to climb a tree. Um, do other squirrels eat meat? Yeah, actually, um, I was just um, sort of reviewing what I knew about the 13 line brown squirrel, and it, in fact, um, is considered relatively carnivorous. It's, it's omnivorous, but um, they will even eat something the size of, um, of, of, of a, a deer mouse, or a, what they might be more likely to encounter a meadow vole, but they would uh, probably share it communally since they're they're colony um, dwellers. Uh, so if they could actually, I think they're more likely to eat carrion or you know to scavenge meat rather than actually killing anything. Um, and this, uh, the same thing is true for um, the other squirrel, well, at least the gray squirrel and the fox squirrel. Um, I can't really say about the red squirrel. I'm, I'm not aware of them being uh, much in the way of meat eaters, but um, it depends on how you view this, too, because um, insects would be um, not plant material, 
and a lot of them will um, encounter insects that they'll eat. So they they could be considered carnivorous, but not you know big things like birds or or uh, mammals that they would uh, actually have to try to kill. But they do they do eat insects. Why do squirrels have bushy tails? Well, that's a really good question, and you'll happen to notice that most of the ones that have bushy tails are ones that are, uh, live in trees. And um, the reason for the bushy tails is it helps them it helps give them balance when they're uh, climbing. Um, it, it's just a, a, a mechanism for helping them balance as they're moving around, especially when they're going from tree to tree, from limb to limb. It helps just, um, you know, sort of regulate their balance. Um, and in the case of the flying squirrels, as I mentioned, um, it also helps kind of be like a little rudder if they want to change directions as they're sort of gliding down from a tree. If you look at the two guys that are mostly ground dwellers, well, other than the, than the uh, groundhog, these two guys don't, don't really have bushy tails um, because they're running around on the ground and um, they don't need as much, uh, they don't need their tails as much for balance. You can see the groundhog it doesn't. It has some fur there, but it's. It doesn't really need it to, to help balance it because it's moving around mostly on the ground. Um, why are black squirrels, the black-faced squirrels, more common in Shenley Park? Well, I think what happens is once the the uh, the trait appears in one individual, um, they are interbreeding with other uh, squirrels and that black face um, just persists in a population where it's first occurred. Um, and you see this in a lot of places. For anybody who's ever gone to um, the Niagara Falls area, if you go north, uh, there's a very large park as you're going toward Niagara on the lake and the black face squirrels are all over the place there. So, um, and that was suggested to me years ago by somebody and I thought, huh, I've never noticed them there. But then once we got out of the city and there, you know, everything that goes on there um, and started to see the squirrels, all of them were black faced squirrels. So um, it just seems that that gene seems to um, persist in the population and, and show up more often once it's, once it's come, um, come up in the population. I might have two more questions. Okay. Um, I found a squirrel's tail in my yard. Can squirrels live without a tail? Well, uh, yes, and I've seen, and as a matter of fact, I've seen um, groundhogs lose parts of their tails before, and I've seen chipmunks lose parts of tails. And it is something that they sometimes have to do to um, get away from something that's trying to prey on them. Um, they probably can. It might be a real hardship. Um, one thing that you have to know is that um, part of that tail is going to have um, some of the vertebrae. So it's some of the vertebrae come down to, I'm going to say, about like here. So if they lose the lower tip, um, they can survive. It might actually be a lot more painful to them if they're actually losing vertebrae. But um, uh, I think they can. They can survive. Uh, the question is whether their um, ability to move around is impaired and that kind of thing. Um, I've seen squirrels with mange where they have uh, lost a, a bunch of fit, uh, fur and that doesn't seem to be real good for them either, but they do survive. Um, it's more of a quality of life thing probably than, than it is actually that they're going to die because they lost their tail. That It would be more of a not an immediate effect, but more whether they're more easily preyed upon by something that moves around in the trees or something like that. Um, and I, I have seen some hawks go after squirrels in my backyard, and the squirrels usually get away, but you know, sometimes um, they may not, I just haven't seen it. Um, 